So I'm going to be talking about Idris. Idris is a uh, new programming language based on dependent types. Um, I could just say that dependent types are uh, types that depend upon values, and I'll be, be, be done, and, I, and we can go home now. Um, but I don't think that's very useful, so I prefer to demonstrate it and point out where dependent types actually come into action. Um, so this is, uh, this is some motivation. This is a drone that runs something called SEL4. It's done by the people in NICTA in Australia. Um, they, it, SEL4 is a formally verified kernel, so it verifies that uh, you can't have buffer overflows, can't have integer overflows, can't have null pointer exceptions. All memory access is safe. Um, it, the drone itself tries very hard not to fall out of the sky, which I think is pretty cool and pretty important. Uh, there was this great presentation by Walter uh, called Adventures in Extraction. Um, it was an experience report of writing Xmonad in Coq. Coq is a, is a language for formal verification and depend, with dependent types. In the experience report, he says extraction is not yet mature. Extraction is the concept of, uh, is, the, is the implementation of taking formally verified uh, dependently typed code and then creating an executable from it. And he says it's, n it's not yet a matured technology. This is in Coq, and this was from like four years ago, but it's about the same right now. Uh, it uses piano numbers, uh, so this is an inductive data type. So th what he was doing is extracting from Coq to Haskell, and piano numbers are really inefficient. It's just an inductive data type. So if you have to represent 1,024, you have to have 1,024 objects in memory, which is not good. Used a lot of uh, unsafe co coerce, which is telling Haskell to just trust the extraction process, which I don't. And there's a lot of blood, sweat, and shell script. Um, that's not good. We don't want to write some formally verified code and then have some shell script involved. Uh, in, in fact, he had a sed script to patch the types. So he wrote uh, formally verified code had a dodgy shell uh, set script to go and replace things in the, in the formally verified output. It's not nice. I don't want to have to have a set script when I'm trying to implement something correctly. Um, so Idris is a take on trying to make dependent types pr more practical. Uh, so when I say dependent types being practical, we can see that SEL4 is a thing and that people are actually using it to try and make drones not fall out of the sky, which I think is very practical. But in terms of making uh, executables, I don't think uh, that's the case. With SEL4, as far as I know, there's, uh, there's proofs written in Isabel about some Haskell code, high-level Haskell code that implements this kernel. And then that is extracted or manually translated into C code to be executed on the drone. So there's about three layers going on. There's Isabel, which is doing the formal proofs of, the, of, the, of memory access and of overflows. And then there's the Haskell layer, which is a high-level implementation, and then C, which is the real implementation. So there's a lot of uh, cost involved in that, and there's a lot of margin of error. So we can do better, and I think executing dependent, having a dependently typed language that compiles to executables is the way to do that. And I want to come up with some practical examples. A lot of the examples are like concatenating vectors together. I'm sorry, but it's not very practical. Um, so I want to do a little bit better. I don't know if I'll, I'll get all the way there, but I want to do a little bit better. Um, so here's a project called Iridium. This is something that I started working on. Uh, it's a window manager, just like Xmonad, but written in, it, uh, in Idris. It's about 6% Idris and 40% Objective-C. That's to call into the Mac APIs that I need to call into. The idea is that it's meant to be abstracted, though. We've got this idea of, uh, of being able to interpret these effects uh, to execute on the platform. So we could theoretically have it work on X11 or Mac. So I'm just going to show it working so we can see some dependent types actually running. Let me create another window first. There we go. So we see dependent types are actually doing things here. It's moving windows around, <laughs> changing layout. So that's all powered through Idris. Uh, so we can actually write real programs with dependent types, which I think is awesome, and we've finally gone to that stage. Um, what I really want to do, though, is actually write some dependent types in front of everyone uh, so that we can learn together, and I'll be able to point out where dependent types are coming into effect. Um, 
So let's, yeah, let's, let's do it. So the first one I want to do is uh, prove an algebraic law about uh, a data type. So I'm going to define something called a bit. It's got two constructors, i and, uh, I and o. Uh, this is meant to be 0 and 1, of course. Um, what I want to do is write a function that does a bitwise or over this data type. <coughs> so I'll just implement this. We'll, we'll see. We'll see how we go. So the implementation, we have to see something about x and x1. So uh, it just allows us to deconstruct these things and uh, create a pattern match on it. So in the case that we've got O, then that should be x1. And in the case of I, that should just be I. Does everybody agree that this is O? Please don't, because I'm going to prove that this is somewhat in the right direction. Um, so what we should, what a property of O is that it's uh, associative. So what that means is that A or B or C equals a so that's the associative property and we should be able to prove that that is the case um, it's not going to prove everything about the or function there's a lot more that we could prove but this is one step for proving our property of this or function so we know that if we were to prove this we know that at least we didn't stuff it up that badly we might have still stuffed it up but not not that badly so I'm going to make a function called or associative. It takes a bit, another bit, and another bit. And this code I wrote just here is actually exactly what we want to prove. That's actually an Idris type. The type is that these things are equal. That's actually a type in Idris. So the first thing, if we load this up, It just says we're trying to prove this thing, which is what I, exactly what I wrote down. And we've got A, B, and C in scope. Now, it doesn't know what the A, B, and Cs actually are. So what we can do is, again, pattern match, load this up, and now we've got different things that we have to prove. So we have to prove that all B and C is equal to all B and C. That's pretty easy, right? So there's actually a constructor called REFL in Idris that does exactly that. When two things are exactly the same and Idris knows that they're exactly the same, they actually show it to you as being the same thing. It's the same thing. Raffle is that thing. Um, the other goal that we had to prove was that i equals i. I think that's pretty easy as well. What I'm actually doing is pressing control C, control A. That gets Idris to do a proof search. So it'll actually find the proof for me. I'm not actually typing it. Like, Idris is constructing my program for me. All I have to do is pattern match, and it found the program for me, which I think is pretty awesome. Now, all probably isn't very practical, but I've got a, little bit, got a little bit more that we can do. So we've got this bit string, which is a list of bits. And see how I've just defined a type as if it was just a value? Um, so what we'll do is make, uh, we'll call it BSOR, just because. So this will take a bit string. Another bit string, and return a bit string. So this is like all but with whole strings rather than rather than just one. And again we'll get Idris to we'll, we'll see what Idris will pattern match for us. And so what we'll do in this case is just accept whatever Idris has given us. I don't know. I'm just making this up. I don't think that's right, though. Is that right? I think it's, it's, it's basically right. Um, in this case, though, this is going to be a bit more interesting. We don't want to accept whatever Idris gives us. So this one will or these two. And then what do we want to do? Something like that. 
I don't know if I'm doing it right, but Idris will hopefully help me out in a minute. So we've got this bit string or. I've tried to implement or over bit strings, not over just a single bit. And we'll do basically what we did before. Except now we're working over bit strings rather than just a single bit. So everyone see that we're, what we're doing? We're, we're doing it over bit strings rather than just bits. So we're proving the associativity of whole strings, bitwise or over whole strings. So Idris is going to tell us what we need to prove, which is exactly what I just stated. And what we can do is just accept whatever Idris is going to give us. So in the, in the case that we've got an empty, um, we've, got the, we've got the empty bit string, then it's the same. Like B, it's just it's just B S or B and C, and we just keep deconstructing each of the each of the fields. And in any case where we've got an empty one, we're done. Once we get an empty bit string, we can prove that those things. It's just using the other two. Now this one's a bit more interesting. So this one's asking us to prove that these two things are the same. And there's, there's multiple things going on here. So there's the associativity of or, which is different, and then it needs to prove the associativity of the rest of the list. So what we can do is come up here, and Idris will ask us to start proving things. So Idris has got two languages in it. Um, one of them is the Idris language, which you can write at the value level and the type level. But then it's also got a tactic language, so you can actually write proofs in a different sort of language, which is a bit more familiar with, uh, uh, a bit more familiar for most people, and also a little bit more succinct uh, for a lot of the cases. So here's the goal that we have to prove: that or and or is associative. We can see that they're different, and we need to make them the same thing. The, the goal is to make these two things the same thing: the, the, the these two ors, this one and that one. So we've already proved that or is associative, right? So what we can do is rewrite that goal with our proof. And you can see that, can everyone see the difference there? So we've proven that the first part is the same. So we're partway there. Now what we should also do is prove the last part. Do those things look the same now? So we've done it for the second. We've, we've, we've proven that the first part of this list is the same. We've proven that the second, the tail of it is the same. So what we can write now is trivial. And here's the best part. You write QED. <laughs> and there you go. Idris sets that out. So it's, it's proven that, uh, that our bit strings are associative. I at least got that much right. I might have gotten some other parts of the algorithm wrong, but. I've at least proven this property. Um, I could prove a lot more about it, but I'll stop there and move on to the second part. <clears throat> so that goal was like correctness. We could prove certain properties about our program. What I want to show now is the expressiveness of dependent types and try and implement something um, that you probably couldn't do unless you had macros. Um, it's actually one of the motivations for things like macros. So I'm going to make something called a bin char. It's indexed by a character. So we've got a value at the type level here. And we'll do something similar like we did before. So this would be a bin char. And we can actually use a character and put it at the type, put it into the type. That one should be a 1. There we go. So now we've got these two constructors. And they've got a, they've got a value thing in the, they've got a value at the, at the type level. Um, so now what we need to also do is have some I want to make a proof that everything in a list can be of something. Hold some sort of uh, predicate. So this predicate is actually going to be from, a t from some value into a type. That's going, to be, that's going to be how we predicate a value. And then I'm going to have a list of those things. So the proof, so we'll have a list of the values and also the proof that a particular value 
sorry, we'll have a proof that the predicate holds for all, each of those values. This curly brace is actually for saying something is implicit, so you don't have to give it each time when you construct this. It, Idris will try and figure it out for us. So we'll have some predicate. And I can make an every. So if you give me an empty list, that predicate holds. If you give me a cons. And then you have to give me a value that that, you have to give me, you have to show me the predicate that that value holds for. And then give me, a, uh, sorry, give me, give me the tail. Oh, yes. Thank you. So what we've done here is said that for, this pr for a value that the predicate holds for um, and a tail for, so for the, rest of the, that rest of the list that this thing holds for, then we can just put that value onto the list and say that it holds for everything in that list again. Now I'm going to write a function that says um, for every, for every bin char in some list, we can get out, oh, and given, given a natural number, we can get out of that. So this is going to be converting from these binary characters into a natural number. Then that there's going to be an accumulator. So again, we'll split. And what we have to do is actually split a bit more than this, because what this wants is, what we have in scope is just some bin char. We want to actually uh, do something a bit more interesting than that. We want, to we want to see what type of bin char it is. So in this case, we just want to recurse in the case that it's O. It doesn't actually, so it's zero. It doesn't actually add anything to the number. And we're just, this accumulator is the, uh, actually, sorry, the count of how many bits we have. So we're just decrementing that. But in the case that we have i, we want to actually raise 2 to the power of k, and then, add, then recurse. I don't know if this is the right thing either. I'm sorry. Um, but what we can do now is that given a string, we can also ask for a proof that everything in that string is a bin char. And so I can't remember the name for going from a string to a list of characters, but what I can do is search for it, if you can see that. So it just kind of has like a built-in hobo into it, which is pretty cool. And so we can see here that there's something called unpack. That's the one I want. So I can just type unpack s. So what I'm doing is unpacking the string that we get as an input and asking for evidence that everything in that string is a bin char. And that should print out a nat. So what we can do is, here, this is actually using the proof. So we can actually use the proof at the value level. Um, we can actually say, so this was going to be from bin chars. And Something like that. So I should be able to load up the REPL now. Right. So Idris doesn't find the evidence. It doesn't automatically find the evidence that every, of, every character in that string is a bin char. So Idris actually has a feature. And you can just put auto before that. And it'll do the proof search, like I said before, how we're searching for proofs. It's going to do the same thing. It's going to try and see if it can construct a bin char for every character in the list. So if I reload this, this code should now work. Supposedly that's 23. I don't know if that's true. Um, I know that's three. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you can see that we've kind of made uh, literals in some sort of sense, because we can't type in 
that. Idris is not going to be able to find evidence that that's a bin char because those, none of those, those digits have, have bin chars. Um, and it will only work if you put in, put in things like that. What we can actually do is say, well, what's this? Is this five? It's four. Let's go four. And so if we go uh, example one, so it'll say it's a compilation error, and it'll actually give us the real thing. So we can actually even leave examples of our evidence, oh, sorry, of our, of our uh, program in, inside as types and say, this thing holds true. And if we were to modify this, the, uh, any of our functions, it would only compile if this also compiled, which I think is pretty awesome. You can leave examples in and only make it compile if, if the value level holds, which is pretty cool. And so I've got one more example. And this is probably my favorite one. So I was looking for uh, some sort of uh, example of uh, computational complexity. So I asked my coworker, worker what's, uh, what's something that you've done recently where the computational complexity wasn't very good? And he was describing this algorithm where he had, he had to compute things over days for every day. And so every day depended on the previous day. So for day one, it depended on day zero, which didn't exist. But it, so he computed for day one. Day two, it depended on day one. And then day three, it depended on day one, day two. So we can see that this is, this is growing in a, in a bad way. Um, this is actually factorial complexity. And I'd like to prove something has a, uh, a factorial complexity, which I think is pretty cool. Um, so what I'm going to do is try and make a data type called cost. So we're going to make a data type called cost. It takes some sort of type, and it also takes a NAT. The NAT is the actual cost of what it takes to compute that value of that type. But the constructor won't actually take the, the cost. Because it's at the type level. We don't really care. Carrying it around at value level, we don't have to do that. We'll just carry it around at the type level. We don't need to carry around the, the runtime cost uh, at runtime. Um, so we'll make a function called uncost. We'll take a cost. It just wrote my program. That was pretty cool. Um, but this will take the value out of the cost, this cost uh, data type that I've just created. So we can, um, we can just use it without having to worry, without having the type be actual, have, uh, contain the cost. Um, also, I'm going to make this a monad. Um, there's an interesting reason why. I'll get to that in a minute. But we'll make the return just take a t and give us any any cost. So we can return like if we wanted to say return and say the cost is a thousand, we can do that. We can make any value any cost, uh, which is a problem and it should probably be private. But I'm sorry. Okay. So I'm going to write a monad. So this is going to be the bind. So given a cost, what should the cost of this monad be? Anyone take a guess? N plus M, which is pretty cool. So if we have these dependent computations, it's just the cost of doing those, both of those. I'm doing something not very nice here, but so we, we, we calculate something. Um, we calculate the, the B cost, so the cost of doing B. We actually remove the cost completely, and then we say, well, the cost is actually N plus M. So here, here I'm, def I'm doing something bit, a bit loose, and I'm just saying, trust me, it's N plus M. It's just something that I've defined. The monad is N plus M. I could do N times M, and it just will just accept it. So there's, 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 no, there's no verification here. This is just some, I'm just stating that bind means n plus m. So what I want to do is write a function that says, 
um, given some, tell me to do something n times. And something that costs something. And also initial value, like an accumulator. Then the cost should be, anyone want to take us to this? If we're doing something, if we're doing this cost n times, what should the cost be? Um, yeah, so the cost is just going to be doing that thing n times. It's, it's really simple. So in the case that we get to the end, so we've done things n times, this is the base case. In the case that we've gotten to the end and we need to do things zero times, then we can just return it and say the cost of doing it, the cost of returning this value is zero. So this return is actually the type of it is 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 going to be cost of zero of a. In this case, we can start using the do notation. This will be the cost. This will be the accumulator. So if we do the thing, we, if we get the value out of the cost, the cost that we get passed in, then we also want to recurse and do it a few more times and just append these things together. I'll do accumulator plus. So it just just verified that that is, in fact, n times n. This should not compile. There you go. Yeah, so it's not, it, we haven't proven that. It's asking for a proof that, um, sorry, it's saying that, the, that they're not the same thing, that, that n is not, is not uh, n times m. I mean, so I'm not actually saying that, but that if you keep going and keep increasing the bounds, that's what you get to. So going back to my coworker's problem, he said that uh, for n days, it was a factorial, the cost was factorial. So I wanna, I wanna, I wanna this isn't his problem. <laughs> this is not what he was trying to do. Um, but I wanna show something with complexity of factorial. String. So we should be able to construct some sort of value that has this cost, has a factorial cost. So I don't know, this is a function that should theoretically, yeah, it, it type checks. So it does something factorial n times. Um, this is because we're recursing over uh, doing the day, and we're also doing it n, uh, n times. So I'm just going to show what this outputs. So if I ask for the day 0, So you can see that it's, that it's climbing up in cost. So it went from cost of two to cost of 24. Say cost of five has gone up to 120, right? Yeah. And you can see that it's making some big string. Um, what if we ask for day seven? It's, it's kind of costly. <laughs> so this is some huge value. Is it like 5,000 or something? I don't, know. I don't know why I've got all these blank. Here we go. So it's, it's some huge string that we probably don't want to ever compute. So theoretically, we should be able to bound this and say, never compute anything that's, what value did I put in seven? Should never be able to compute anything more than seven. So theoretically, I can make all of this private and only expose this function where I say, only do things that are less than, than seven. So there's a function like, that can go from, so fin is a, is a 
actually, there's a, there's a cool feature in Idris here, uh, if I can remember it. Here we go. So um, we can say, like, we can ask for documentation. So fin is something that's less than some bounds. So we can say fin of uh, seven would be, have to be some number less than seven. So we can run programs as long as you give me a number that's less than seven. Um, and there's also, so fact takes a natural number. So I need to go from a fin of n to a nat. And here we go, there's a, there's a function for that. It's going to give us a string. So we should be able to do that fin to nat thing again. And if we load up the REPL, so if we you only use run or if we're only exposed run in this module, we could run anything that's less than less than seven but we can't run anything more than seven. Or we can't run, we can't even run seven. It has to be less than. So it's pretty cool that we've proven that, uh, so first of all, we've proven that the cost of uh, evaluating this function is uh, factorial. So the, com the computational complexity is factorial. It doesn't necessarily have to be computational. We could theoretically um, make this memory, so the me memory usage would be factorial. Um, but we've proven that it's factorial, and we've also proven that uh, we've also made a function and made it so that you can't run factorial for anything uh, greater than six, which is pretty cool. So we're guaranteed that the runtime is within some sort of bounds. No, is anybody impressed by that? <laughs> I was. It's pretty cool. Um, yeah, so... So you just learned the ABCs of... I'm sorry. Um, the algebraic laws, the binaries, and uh, complexities of, of Idris. Um, I think this gives some motivation. Um, algebraic laws give some motivation for correctness. If we were to write a lot of algebraic laws about data types, we could have some sort of confidence that our algorithms are, uh, uh, are correct. Uh, I've given some sort of idea about the expressiveness of domain types. We can have binary literals. So we can prove that only zeros and ones are in a particular string, and not only that, but they can be converted into a natural number, and we just use them. Um, I've also showed that we can track uh, computational complexity inside of the type system, and we can uh, put limits on what, what we would like to execute. What I showed with the, compu with the complexity was that we can calculate exactly what it is, but we could also theoretically have best case, worst case, and also average case. There's no reason why we can't track that inside the type system. Um, I also showed that we could do, uh, we could write examples inside of our programs and only let them compile if, the, if that example actually worked at the value level. So we don't even have to open, open up a REPL, don't have to write some tests, we can just write them as types inside of Idris. Um, that is all the content I have, and there's one final photo of my dog. Uh, <laughs> he's, he's at home at the moment, I miss him. Um, that's, that's it. Thank you. We've got six minutes for talks, uh, for questions. Yeah? So when you implemented the uh, bind for cost, uh -huh. um, what you did there, wasn't that effectively equivalent to casting your, your dependent type? Uh, you were just asserting that it's, it's n plus m. Yes. So that's, that's I mean. Cost. I, w I wouldn't say it's a cast, it's an assertion. It's a cast. Okay. <laughs> I'm happy to cast it. Like, so yes, I have, to, I have to verify that the bind, that I've done the right thing there. Um, but I could come up with a different model. Maybe I wanted so that cost multiplies each other. I don't know. Well, I guess, I guess the, the fundamental question that I have is, um, how is it that the, the, the proofs about complexity are not then predicated on that one assertion? Yes, bind has to be correct. And everything is predicated on that, yes. Yep. That's still pretty great. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty cool. Even if it's a cast, I don't know. We're going to have some more questions. I've got like six minutes, so. Yeah. Um, so for parsing your binary literal, I mean, when it's literal, like, you can do some file time. I think I can see how it works. If I wanted to use that function with like a Yeah. 
yes, you have to do exactly this. You have to give me some, you have to give me evidence that everything in the list can be converted into a binary character. So you have to write some sort of filter or, or prove to me in some way that everything in that string has a binary character and you have to give me them. But yes, we, we could do that. Like it's, it's very simple. That is exactly the evidence you have to provide at, at, at runtime. Sorry, at compile time to prove that your thing at runtime is going to work. Yeah, very easy. Sometimes works. <laughs> what do you mean by through calls? I don't know what that. Right. Do you have to manually pass through everything and show evidence? Um, the question was, um, how well does Idris uh, work with actually having to carry through proofs everywhere throughout your program and show evidence to the propositions that you're, that you're claiming? Um, like I showed before, like here, so we've got these square, sorry, we've got these, uh, we've got these curly braces. That means it's implicit. So you don't actually have to provide it to Idris. Idris will find it in the environment. So that's the first thing. And also auto means that it will do a proof search. Um, but that's usually for things like literals. Um, in the case where if you have things from runtime, you'll have to explicitly pass it in. You can't just rely on it just automatically finding you a proof for something that's happening at runtime. It can't do that. That'll be cool, though. Impossible, but cool. Um, so yeah, if you, if you make things implicit, Idris will find the proofs and automatically carry them through, which is pretty useful. Otherwise, it's really verbose and really ugly and really annoying. Um, but it's safe. That's pretty cool. Yes. Um, yeah. That's cool. So Idris, Idris can infer um, lots of things. It works by unification. So if it sees something at the value level, um, sorry, if it, sees some, if it sees a value that has the right, uh, that has a particular cost, then it can infer that that cost is, is, is that thing. So what you could theoretically do, I don't know if this is going to work. We'll, we'll give it a go. So let's say we've got f, which takes a cost, let's say it's 2 cost two to compute this string. Um, and we have g. I don't know what the cost of this is, but it's going to use f. OK, so it wants me to prove, OK, it's not going to work. <laughs> so usually what, what, what can happen is that uh, it just can sometimes inf uh, figure out what that nat actually is, sort of said two. For some reason, it's giving me that, and I'm not sure why. Um, I have to, yeah, so it, it, doesn't, it doesn't actually give me that. But there are some cases where you can just leave in question marks and say, just, just search for the evidence that this is. So you could theoretically do proof search, I think it is. Oh, there you go. That worked. So now I can ask for, what's the cost? What's the type of G? <laughs> OK. Um, work? There we go. If we say three, it's like, there you go. So yeah, it, it, so you can see there that it's inferred the cost. So we didn't actually have, we can put in, we can put in the, we can say that it's a cost and that's going to return a string. We don't have to fill in the particular cost and we can let that be inferred um, by just doing a proof search. Uh, it does, it, it, it just type inference. A lot of people say dependently typed uh, languages have bad type inference, but in my experience, that's not true at all. It infers a lot of things. Um, Basically, because it works on unification, it has a lot more information about my program. It's really cool. I've got almost, I think I've got no time left. So if you want to come talk to me, that'd be awesome. I've got like, lots of exercises for people to play around with. And I've got like, lots of, I, I can work with people. I really want to get people interested in Idris. And I didn't mention before, but I wouldn't use Idris in production. So don't, don't go off doing that. I'm not, trying to give, I'm not trying to give you impressions that Idris is a perfect program language and doesn't have bugs. There's actually a couple of bugs in here that I didn't want to point out, but actually I'll point them out. I've got, <laughs> I've got a few seconds. So notice how there's this squiggly line here? It's actually giving me a warning that this thing is not total, but it is. Just trust me. <laughs> I know more than Idris. 
Um, if I rewrite this, in a, this is actually a workaround. If I rewrite this in a slightly different way, it says it's total, but it's, it should be isomorphic, the two ways that I write them. They should be exactly the same. Uh, so you'll have to trust me that that's a bug. Um, but yes, if, if you want to work with me, um, uh, playing around with these things, um, like we should be writing blogs in, we should be writing blog, blog software in Idris. Probably shouldn't be writing product, production software, but let's write, let's write, I don't know, common, what is it, common markdown? Let's start formally verifying that. I don't know. <laughs> Let's, let's play around. I don't, I don't recommend us using it at work straight away because there are bugs, but we should start playing around with it. So thank you. <laughs>